Welcome to Eurodollar University with Jeff Snyder. My name is Emil Kalinowski, and we are going to be talking about the Federal Reserve Bank of New York latest economic projections and whether or not they confirm, corroborate the narrative, the optimistic outlook, the more less negative outlook that's being given to the financial press by the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Jeff, what is the thesis? What is the key point that the audience should take away after they're done listen to, listening to us? Janet Yellen. What? Jay Powell. Okay. Joe Biden. All of them have said just recently, I hear this recession talk out there and I don't see anything. I'm Janet Yellen. I'm the Treasury Secretary, damn it. And I was Federal Reserve Chairman. I see no chance of a downturn. Jay Powell missed his chance to be Paul Vo He should have gone all Ryan Fitzpatrick, grew his beard out, put on the sunglasses, the leather jacket, and said, I'm Paul Volkering this crap. I'm going to I'm going to create recessions, damn it. No, Jay Powell missed his chance to do that and said, downturn? I don't see any downturn. Things look fine to me. President Biden, because he's going to do this. And again, just to make clear, we're not picking on Democrats or one side of the aisle. If it had been Trump, he'd have said the same damn thing. His secretary, Treasury Secretary, would have said the same thing. And his Federal Reserve Chairman, which happens to be Jay, which happened to be Jay Powell, also said the same things in 2018 and 2019, which is hear no downturn, see no downturn, speak no downturn. Jeff, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has a model that does what? It forecasts output growth. And what is the latest reading? We talked about this a little bit with Alfonso on our recent interview with, with him. And for the audience that didn't see that interview, he explained it, you explained it to us now. What is the Bank of New York telling us? Well, as the name implies, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is one of the branches of the Federal Reserve. And Jay Powell is chairman of the Federal Reserve, so you would think that he would consult with his models. And some you could say, well, this is just one branch, and it's their own calculations using their own assumptions. But the reason we're bringing this up is that, yes, it is the Federal Reserve Bank branch in New York, and they are using their own models. But let's face it, these econometric models, especially the dynamic stochastic equilib general equilibrium models, the DSGE models, they're pretty much all the same. So if this DSGE model is spitting out these numbers, which we'll get to in a second, you can be reasonably assured that other DSG models are spitting out similar numbers, in particular what's called FRBUS, F-R-B-U-S, which is the Federal Reserve staff, the board in, the, in, in Washington, their staff's main DSGE model, which is, I mean, it's not going to be very much different at all. Maybe there's a little bit of, of, of wiggle room in here in between them. But if this FRBNY um, DSGE model and its simulations between March and June, now updated, are showing what they're showing now, again, you can be reasonably, you can reasonably assume that the main models that the Fed uses are looking very similar, at least in the same ballpark. This model is not as popularly known as the Atlanta Fed model. Do you happen to know why that one's more preferred? Is it because that one is real time and updated frequently? Well, they're tracking two different things. Okay. The Atlanta Fed is attempting to tell you what the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis GDP number the next quarter will be. It's not actually trying to interpret macroeconomic circumstances or variables. It's only trying to forecast what the next quarter's GDP number will be. So you can see how each individual data point that maybe goes into that GDP calculation affects it as it goes through time. Whereas the FRB and Y's DSGE models is not doesn't really care about what the BEA's calculation numbers are going to be. It's trying to look at macroeconomic factors and conditions and forecast what output in general is going to look like across a range of scenarios moving forward in time. So we're looking out a couple years and thinking, what is the probability the economy does really well? What is the probability the economy doesn't do well? Or what is maybe the probability the economy not doing either, which means we don't really know what the hell's going on? So it's two different models where the DSG models are more about underlying fundamental characteristics rather than just trying to figure out calculations. Now, the graph that you include in your article here, Jeff, did I mention to the audience what it was called? I don't believe I did. 
It's called Sorry Chairman Powell. Even FRBNY now has to forecast serious and seriously rising recession risk. And that was posted on the 19th of June, 2020 at Alhambra Investments. And people who are listening to a podcast, they can go there and see the graph that the YouTube audience is seeing right now. And the, the graph that they're seeing, Jeff, seems to suggest that from 2022 all the way through and into 2024, output is below the zero line, just barely, just barely. But that seems like a very long time for output to be negative. What the models are basically telling you is that the midpoint, which is sort of the statistical distribution of all these simulations, is basically saying, you know, before the March update back, back a couple months ago, it was slightly positive, which meant the outlook was sort of cloudy. And now they're saying is something has materially changed where the outlook is not is still a bit cloudy, but it's moved much, much more to the downside. Now, because these are st statistical models, they're going to have a range of scenarios. They're going to have a range of estimates, which means some of them look pretty darn good, whereas some of them look really, really bad. And what the models are essentially telling you is we're looking at them changing through time, whereas at the March update, there were more really, really good, more in the middle, and fewer of the downside projections than there are today. Today, the skew has gone in the exact opposite direction, where there are much fewer really, really good scenarios, much more that are sort of not really good, like you know, two years of GDP contraction, and then even more that are worse than that. And the way we interpret that is that the it isn't the, the output or the models are saying that GDP is going to contract over the next two years consistently. What they're saying is that the chances are two years from now, there's a better than even chance that GDP will be lower than it is than it was in the fourth quarter of 20, uh, 2021. So from 2021 Q4 to 2023 Q4, there's a growing chance that GDP will be less. It doesn't tell us why that is or how that is, but just that it, whatever the, the uh, independent and the, the variables that are thrown into these regression equations, they're now seeing more of a chance of going toward the downside than not. And Jeff, it wouldn't matter for people that watch this show if the median projection was just barely above zero. The result is the same. It's pathetic, yeah. it's unacceptable, and the silent depression continues just because we're growing at 1% or less per year. Just ask Japan what sort of positive numbers, if they make a real difference, if they're so close to zero anyway. Jeff, what you were describing, I think is captured much better in your graph as what, if we also factor in what I was just saying, how it doesn't matter how much growth there is, if it doesn't matter if the number is positive, if the growth is not strong enough. And here we can see that on your graph of U.S. real GDP and that baseline that we should be reaching and even, well, tell people what that cone means and how we don't get to where we should be under any of these positive scenarios even. Yeah, it's really a shame. What we're saying here is that we're not even using the pre-2008 baseline, which is really where we should be by all respects, because that's, that's so far away from now. It's, it's, it's basically a dreamland. We're talking about six, six and a half trillion GDP more than where we are now. We're just trying to get back to where the economy was in 2019, which, as Emil was saying, wasn't really that good to begin with. That's really what the silent depression was all about. So along comes the COVID recession or the unnecessary COVID recession. The economy falls off. And we can't even now, more than two years later, or at least two years in the data, we can't even get back to the peak where we were, where we should have been. It, uh, following 2020 or 2019 into 2020. We can't even get back to there. And now everything that we're seeing, including F FRBNY's DSG model says, it's not likely we're going to get back to that prior 2019 and before trend. The best case scenarios from this DSG model don't even get us there until maybe somewhere around 23, 24, maybe 25. And those are the low probability upsides as it was. 
The real message in these numbers that I'm trying to portray here is starting from that weak perspective, because that's a weak economy. And you can already clearly see that the economy, the GDP at least, fell in the first quarter of 2022, already strike one. Um, over the next several years, the DESG model that we're focusing on at FRBNY has downgraded the, the projection so substantially that what is now the midpoint projection is actually what used to be the low side projection from March. So we've got an even more downside risk uh, in this DSGE model because the, even the models are saying something substantially has changed between March and June. And it has changed such that something is going to happen or something is, very, is more likely than not to happen, which will leave GDP over the next couple of years even lower than it was, which was already too low in 2021. And that can work out to a couple different scenarios. As we talked about with Alfonso, it could mean that the, the U.S. economy goes into recession, a prolonged shallow recession that lasts two years, like a literal interpretation of the midpoint. It could be that we go into a very sharp recession right now into the second half of the year. And we're only starting to come back in 2023. And that's why output is lower over the next couple of years. It could be any number of scenarios where we could have a double dip recession. We could have a short recession, a bit of a recovery, a false recovery, and then another, I mean, any number of things where the net result over the next little while is going to be even worse than it was when we started this whole thing. This graph here shows me that by the end of, at the beginning, of 2024, the best case scenario, according to the FRBNY, is that we will be back on the very lousy trend we were before COVID hit. And that, Jeff, that very lousy trend is given the most favorable view because that trend here, you're excluding 2008. You go from 2009. So from the trough you're measuring, that's a lot of boost. That's that rebound all the way through 2019 before COVID hit. So the best possible view of the lousiest economy in over a century, we might get there if everything goes right by the end of 2023. All right. Well, that's great. So Careful, you're saying right? there's a chance, <laughs> Jeff. This is great. Yes. No, and I think the, the point is, um, the overall point is that, you know, again, even if the DSG, and again, DSGE models, people may not know this, they're not made to show recession. You really have to shock the crap out of these things to get negative numbers out of them. They're like the establishment survey where they're so smoothed out, they want to stay on a baseline. It really takes a lot to get them to move into something like a recession sort of scenario. And that's a whole separate question about what is it the DSGEs are seeing versus what markets are seeing. But again, as we've been saying for over a year now, this is the exact scenario that markets have been pricing. It has gotten to the point where even the reluctant recession re indicators like these FRBNY model are starting to pick up this downside because something substantial has changed between March and June. Uh, and it's likely to continue changing in the direction because, as we said in previous episodes, markets are getting worse and worse and worse, not better. I can't